The topic today is going to be ADHD and behavioral disorders. When I first got interested in ADHD and behavioral disorders, having had five children of my own uh, and, and, um, and, and knew their friends, uh, the belief generally at that time was that it really had to do with life experiences and stresses and problems that, that, had, that, that it really emerged uh, along with problems in life. And what we learned uh, in, is, is that, in fact, a lot of most children that have ADHD were born with a tendency for that, and it has to do with their brain chemistry. Um, the Walsh Research Institute is a public charity, a 501c3. Our expertise is basically in brain disorders and brain chemistry and neuroscience. Our, as Dana mentioned, we have a physician training program. Uh, that has now uh, reached more than 600 doctors throughout. I think we now have 30 different countries uh, where we have doctors doing these therapies, these protocols that I'll be describing. And we're also very active in research. We recently believe that we have found the, the underlying mechanisms of bipolar disorder and presented that recently at the American Psychiatric Association annual meeting. We also have a very active schizophrenia research project going on. So with ADHD, we have, I think, possibly the world's biggest chemistry database for ADHD. It encompasses 5,600 patients where we have great, you know, great detail of their blood and urine chemistries. We have more than a half million blood and urine chemistries. And uh, equally important really are the medical history factors because the symptoms and traits of a child or an adult uh, tell you quite a bit about their chemistry, their brain chemistry, and their chemical imbalances. So um, the first thing we found was in looking at our database is that people with ADHD are different from the rest of the population in, in many ways. And they're different in, 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 in different ways for different people. For example, we now know that 68% of all children diagnosed with ADHD have abnormally high blood copper levels. And I'll, I'll be explaining why that's important, why that directly affects uh, a couple of important neurotransmitters in a, in a very massive way. They also have insufficient ceruloplasmin, that's 92% of them, and that's a protein that helps manage copper. And so if you have too little ceruloplasmin, that is a marker for oxidative stress. Um, zinc depletion in, in 96%, in other words, they, um, the, the population, only 4% had an ideal level of zinc. Uh, we use the word depletion instead of deficiency because that includes people who are low normal and would, would be better off if they had a higher level. Methylation disorders occur in more than half, 55%. Pyrrhal disorder, 30%. And malabsorption, a relative inability or inefficiency at utilizing the nutrients in diet, that's 11%. So let's start as an example with copper imbalance. So this is more than two thirds of ADHD um, children and actually also adults. Um, copper levels are regulated in your body by metallothionine, which we call MT because it's easier to say. And that is a genetically expressed protein that has the job of, of keeping our copper level normal regardless of, of what's happening. Uh, I always tell people that if, if you could even be chewing on, on bars of copper and if your metallothionine system is working, your blood levels will still be quite normal. But that does, system doesn't work for everyone. Uh, their metallothionine genetically expressed has these things called SNPs or weaknesses that some people have and others don't. And that can, and that can um, impair the ability to keep copper levels where they belong. And so uh, these SNP mutations can, can uh, result in copper overload and zinc deficiency. The two tend to go together. So for us, copper zinc ratio is important. One of the most important things for ADHD is that excess copper severely depletes dopamine levels. So um, 
Ritalin and Adderall, the very medications used effectively in many uh, ADHD patients, the, what it primarily does is that it, it increases dopamine activity. Well, here we find that 68% that of all ADHD patients have a chemical imbalance that's correctable that, uh, that, that can boost your dopamine activity. And we find that many patients uh, who have been on, on Ritalin or Adderall, once we correct the copper level, they no longer need the medication. Um, and, and, and basically low dopamine function is considered the number one associated factor for ADHD. So just to give you an example of this, this is the synthesis of norepinephrine. Uh, all of our norepinephrine, which is a neurotransmitter, comes from dopamine. And this is, this is happening right in your brain cells. Um, and this figure shows that reaction. You have dopamine on the left, and then uh, with the assistance of, a, of an enzyme called dopamine beta hydroxylase, that's one of the most famous enzymes in biochemistry, together with copper, divalent copper, copper plus plus, vitamin C and oxygen, um, then that results in norepinephrine. Now the copper actually has to loosely bind to that enzyme for this enzyme, for this reaction to go. So if a person has excessive copper levels, which happens in more than, than two thirds of ADHD kids and adults, you, you have too little dopamine and far too much norepinephrine. Dopamine, as I mentioned before, is, is central to ADHD. And that's why the medications are aimed at elevating dopamine. But this is the reason why many of these, of these children and adults have low dopamine. And norepinephrine, uh, that is a neurotransmitter that has everything to do with hyperactivity. And so uh, it's a double whammy. If you have elevated copper, your dopamine levels will be low. That'll cause inattention uh, and distractibility and, and many of the problems associated with um, academic uh, attainment in school. And then also the hyperactivity because of the norepinephrine. So we know why this happens now. We also know how to fix this. So uh, the process we use is a medical, a medical uh, process. Uh, we call it individualized nutrient therapy. And our goal is to normalize, to balance and normalize neurotransmission, especially the neurotransmitters that have everything to do with ADHD and, and, and proper use of your brain. So, Medical history and review of symptoms is really important. And the reason is that the chemical imbalances very, I have a tendency to uh, exhibit themselves with certain traits and symptoms. For example, I just mentioned high elevated copper. Well, they tend to have difficulty focusing and they tend to be in general hyperactive. Uh, methylation disorders are also similar. Every, every one of these imbalances can, you can pretty much predict the blood results once you do a really good medical history and review of symptoms. And of course, we need special blood and urine lab tests to find out exactly what are these chemical levels. Are they normal? Are they in, in, in where they ought to be? Or are they abnormal and are they affecting the brain? And based on the history and based on, and then together with the lab work, then the next step is to diagnose chemical imbalances, and then we develop and design a prescribed nutrient program aimed at normalizing brain chemistry and neurotransmission. So that's basically what we do. Uh, the major types of ADHD, this, these are listed in the, um, in, in the diagnostic manual for psychiatry, and there are three major types in attention hyperactivity and impulsivity. And then the third combination is people who have a combination of one and two. In other words, they have inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. In addition, uh, a lot of, um, there's a very high comor what they call comorbidity, where not only does the, many of these children have not only ADHD, but they also have a behavior issue that behavior is often, uh, behavior disorders are often part of it. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. So let's first focus on number one, 
the number one type of ADHD, which is typical inattention biochemistry. The, the, the defining factors are number one, low dopamine activity, copper excess. They tend to have low activity of GABA. GABA is, the, is one of the two most common neurotransmitters and, and GABA itself is a, is, a, is, is a neurotransmitter and tends to be low in these children and adults. And then, as I mentioned before, zinc deficiency or, or depletion. So the treatment approach for this group, we need to increase neurotransmission and dopamine and GABA receptors. And fortunately, we know how to do that with nutrients. Yes, there are drug medications that can do the same thing, but we feel that, that this approach is really the first thing to do and that the, the drugs are more of a last resort. So uh, what, what, what is our treatment doing? We're inhibiting expression of reuptake proteins. Now that may seem a little technical to some of you. The, uh, the neurotransmission of dopamine is dominated not by the amount of dopamine in your brain, but by, the, the, by reuptake by the ability of the dopamine once it's, it's shot into a synapse to get back into that original brain cell, that original brain neuron. And it's controlled by, by, by reuptake. And uh, we learned that about 30 years ago. And that was the time when, uh, for depression, for example, uh, the, the focus medically uh, went toward reuptake inhibition, like Prozac, Paxil, those things, those drugs for depression because they knew that reuptake was the real issue. Same thing is true for ADHD. And so our, our, our treatment approach is to inhibit the reuptake that would trap the dopamine in the synapse longer so you get more, more effectiveness of that. Um, and the, the specific nutrients we use are zinc, B6, methionine for those who uh, because because uh, nearly everyone with low dopamine activity is undermethylated, so we tend to um, dose them with methionine or a nutrient called SAME, S-A-M-E, which is which is you might think of as activated methionine uh, for to enhance methylation and again to elevate dopamine activity. Now. To illustrate this, I've got a number of case histories. Now, this is for inattention. This case history is, I think, quite typical. A young man named George, age 10. Now, he had good behavior. He seemed to be motivated. He's trying to do his best, but he had very, very poor concentration. Uh, a number of people would call him a space cadet. And uh, his diagnosis was ADHD, and it was, seemed to be a correct diagnosis to all of us. He was in special education and was taking Ritalin, and the Ritalin was helping him, although it tended to uh, affect his appetite, and in fact, his growth chart showed that, that his growth rate had declined a bit. Um, and also, his serum copper was shockingly high. A normal level for copper in blood is between 80 and 100, and he was 163. And his plasma zinc was very low at 68. The ideal level for zinc is between 100 and 120. So George had a was born with a really nasty copper zinc imbalance. The very the very chemistry that causes low dopamine activity and a, and, and a tendency for for an overactive brain. Uh, his histamine level was an 82, which is is somewhat high, and that tends toward uh, that, that tends toward low serotonin activity and low dopamine activity. In the case of ADHD, it's the dopamine we're more concerned with. So anyway, this is what George had. He had, his chemistry was terrible. Uh, we always rejoice when we see a patient who has terrible chemistry because chemistry can be corrected. And uh, very often you can eliminate these inborn tendencies and problems. So we treated him for, with zinc, B6, Selenium, which is a really good antioxidant, methionine to elevate his dopamine activity, and antioxidants, uh, vitamin C and E. So the outcome, um, we, we've learned through experience with more than 5,000 cases that when um, a 
patient is on a medication such as Ritalin or Adderall or, or whatever, that we get our best results if we keep them on the, the, the drug medication. So we, we like to do both together, usually for at least two or three months. So we continued the Ritalin, which was helping to some degree during the initial Dutrian therapy. For the first three weeks, not much happened. And, because, and the reason is it takes about six weeks to normalize elevated copper, to fix a copper zinc imbalance. So the family said nothing happened the first three weeks. But after three months, his academics were much improved. He no longer needed special education. And uh, his, his psychiatrist uh, weaned him off of Ritalin, not, not to get rid of the Ritalin, but to find out the, now that we had a new reality and he was better, the question is what would be the optimum dose of Ritalin? And so they very slowly lowered the Ritalin level and uh, we were told that, that he was at his best with zero Ritalin. Now I wanna mention that about 20% of the time in a case like this, we, we, we find that uh, the patient loses something if you go all the way to zero with, with the medication, with the amphetamine. And, and we say, so be it, because we are not against Ritalin. We just want the child to be at their best. But even in that case, the, um, the dosage is so low that whatever side effects might be there are usually gone. So that's what happened in that case. Um, so let's talk about hyperactivity. Um, not all ADHD, even though ADHD, the H means hyperactivity, not all of them have hyperactivity, but those that do virtually always have excessive activity at norepinephrine and adrenaline receptors. These are, these are neurotransmitters that have a lot to do with your energy, and it, ha it has a lot to do with hyperactivity of your brain neurons. Your brains are just, if you, hit, if you did a, a brain scan of someone who was hyperactive, it would light up like a Christmas tree because there's so much activity going on. And it's, I guess you would call it too much of a good thing. And usually it has to do with either copper overload or an imbalance called overmethylation. Um, overmethylation occurs in about 8% of human beings, but it's, uh, it's uh, uh, higher than that in people with ADHD, especially those that have hyperactivity. And we have a nutrient therapy that can help normalize methylation. Okay, so the treatment approach for hyperactivity is we want to reduce neurotransmission of these two neurotransmitters, norepinephrine and adrenaline. And we do that simply by normalizing serum copper and plasma zinc. And to, and to do that, we need zinc, B6, GABA actually is a neurotransmitter that tends to offset excessive, excessive norepinephrine. That's how GABA works, and it's a calming neurotransmitter, and it, it, it slows down the, the, uh, the, the hyperactivity of the brain neurons. And uh, if, the, if the patient also had over, overmethylation, we would give them folates and B12. So not all of them get the folates and B12, only those that are also overmethylated. So a case history for this case was a, another 10 year old, Peter, hyperactive, he had poor concentration and he was failing in school. Uh, he had an ADHD diagnosis. He was taking Adderall and which improved to some degree, although he didn't have some weight loss from the, from the medication. <clears throat> His copper zinc ratio just like the last patient was very, very high. It was 1.8. That ratio really should be between 0 0.8 and 1.0. The other chemistries were normal, which was good because we only had to worry about correcting this particular imbalance. So what happened to Peter? Uh, he also was taking Adderall. And again, we in this case, I'm sorry, he was taking Adderall, which we continued. We continued the medication during the first three months. Um, his hyperactivity got slightly worse during the first week. We understand that because what we have to do is to get the copper, the excess copper out of these people's bodies. And if we do it a little bit too quickly, the copper level in the bloodstream for the first few days or maybe a week is even higher than before. So the hyperactivity sometimes gets a little worse the first week, followed by improvement, gradual, steady improvement. After three months, his concentration was improved, academics were a lot better, 
and his Adderall was no longer necessary. So uh, behavior disorders occur about, oh, it depends on the type of, of the type of ADHD, but an episodic there's something called episodic rage disorder. These are children who are, are kind of a, a sweet personality and they're generally well-behaved and obedient, but when they lose their temper, it, it's like a, uh, it can be like a, a volcano erupting and, it, and they, it's called, psychiatrists call it episodic rage disorder. And about 50% of people diagnosed with ADHD have this problem. It's not just a matter of learning and concentration in school. It also means their behavior, they have these behavior upsets. Oppositional defiant disorder. These are children who have a really strong will. I like to say a will of iron. And they, they're born that way, by the way. And that has to do with undermethylation. And 35% of our patients have that. Conduct disorder. These are children who not only have behavior problems, but they like to destroy things and they, they tend to get in fights. And that's about 20%. Fortunately, it's only one in five, but still for those 20%, it's a, it's a major problem. Antisocial personality disorder. Now that is an extraordinarily severe inborn behavior disorder. Uh, this, these are the people that as adults, uh, they're often called sociopaths. Fortunately, it's only 4% of those with ADHD. And I'm happy to say that we've had really good results uh, in helping children with that imbalance. But we learn we have to get them young. You have to get them before their, before puberty to really help them. So the treatment for oppositional defiance focuses on serotonin and NMDA. Serotonin uh, levels seem to be really low in oppositional defiance kids. And, uh, and also their NMDA receptor uh, tends to have low neurotransmission. And uh, the, the primary treatment for them is either SAMI or methionine, which are methylators, to enhance expression of the reuptake gene for serotonin. Again, it's not the amount of serotonin that determines serotonin neurotransmission. If that's about a 5 or 10% effect. It's the reuptake, the genetic expression of this cert reuptake gene. And uh, methionine or SAMI, tend to really enhance that and the folates do the opposite. So the, the folates, which are good for undermethylation, they tend to make oppositional defiance worse. So it's, it's because of epigenetics, which is a new, a new, a new uh, field that we're learning more and more about. And we also want to promote glutamate activity at the NMDA. And it, it can do that really nicely with antioxidants, zinc, selenium, GSH is glutathione, and there's recent research showing that NAC and acetylcysteine is really effective for doing this. So we, I would, if I were to add something to the list, it would be NAC. So case history, uh, Mary, uh, age 10, she had a very strong will, oppositional to authority. There was no reward you could give this girl that would make her change what she did, or there was no punishment that would be enough to make her change. Uh, she, she just um, re refused to respond to, you might say, the carrot and stick approach, also known as behavioral therapy. Um, but she was defiant. She was really quite bright, refused to study, didn't like her teacher. She was in a special classroom. She was uh, engaged in counseling, which probably helped to some degree. And she was taking Vyvanse medication. When we tested her, she flunked the test for blood histamine. Her histamine was 153, whereas normal is between 40 and 70. So she had severe undermethylation. She was born with that. None of this was her family's fault, and really it wasn't Mary's fault. She was born with these very tendencies. Her zinc level was, was not bad. Her copper level was okay, and everything else was okay. The only problem she had was her, her histamine level was extraordinarily high, and that, that's a marker for methylation, it's not the it's not the hist histamine is important. It's the methylation that's important and the low serotonin activity that that indicates. So the outcome for Mary, uh, her treatment we we gave her methionine, calcium, magnesium are augmenting nutrients. It'd be better if her zinc level is a little bit higher and uh, B6 also is helpful in the synthesis of serotonin. So she had some B6. 
and then some antioxidants, selenium, vitamins A, C, D, E. Uh, after week four, we, we, we got reports of improvement uh, and then the slow gradual process, and it really took three months. Undermethylation is the slowest uh, imbalance to respond. It, it just, it takes a long time for, to change the reuptake of serotonin in, from the synapse. And what we're really doing is the, we're changing the population of these reuptake proteins that are passageways in your brain cells for, in, in this case, for, <coughs> for serotonin that's in the synapse to return to the original cell. And that, that dominates neurotransmission. Anyway, the good news is Mary returned to mainstream classroom. She became more cooperative. She still had a strong will, uh, but she was willing to do homework. The counseling was continued to seem to be helping and no longer needed the Vivans. Some of the children we, we see, 50% uh, of the ADHD have this episodic rage disorder where they have really good behavior with episodes of anger. Uh, it's often called Jekyll Hyde behavior. Uh, but they, one characteristic is once they calm down, they usually have genuine remorse. The problem is it just keeps happening over and over. Typical chemistry is usually either a pyrrole disorder or a copper zinc imbalance. And so we, we test for pyrroles, we test for the metal metabolism, and we act accordingly. If, uh, if they have a pyrrole disorder, that means a striking um, deficiency of B6 and zinc. If they have a copper zinc imbalance, we use the treatment described before uh, to, to bring the, the, the copper level down to normal. Um, sometimes we have to do both. Treatment approach is, again, normalizing serum copper, plasma zinc, and urine pyrroles. John, age 14, another case history. He was a good student, cooperative, had a lot of friends, generally calm, but he would have rages daily. Uh, I recall with him it was five or six times a day. He would just have these uncharacteristic anger outbursts. He was uh, engaged in counseling and, and Zoloft, and, and we were told that they both seemed to be helping, but he was still having rage outbursts, although not quite as frequently. Again, we're testing his, his, his pyrroles turned out to be normal. So we didn't have to worry about that, but his copper zinc imbalance was shockingly high. It was, it was extraordinary. In fact, we were wondering why his behavior wasn't worse than that, considering his chemistry being so terrible. And he was, again, he was born with this. Uh, copper level should have been around 80 or 90 or 100. It was nearly double that at 189. Zinc level should have been above 100, and it was low at 76. So the treatment is this gradual introduction of zinc. And we have to do it gradually because we don't want the copper, the excess copper, to leave too quickly. So we've learned that to avoid side effects, we need to build up the zinc level gradually, maybe over two or three or four weeks. And again, antioxidants are really important, vitamin C, E. We continued that the Zoloft uh, continued for two months, but then they found he no longer needed Zoloft. And so he did well. Now, I want to point out that not everybody gets better. I don't want to give the impression that every single patient responds. However, we've done a number of outcome studies, and we've published some, a couple of peer review studies and uh, what we know is that uh, about 80 to 85 percent of our patients report improvement and their doctors report improvement. Um, it, it depends on the imbalance. If pyrroles are the only issue, that's about 90 percent of them report great improvement. Copper zinc is more in the 80 to 85 percent and the, uh, those that have the um, undermethylation and, and the very strong will and, and ODD, oppositional defiant disorder, that's more around 65 or 75%. That's still very good. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's better than you'll find with results that, that are published for, for psychiatric medications. But um, again, I don't want you to get the feeling that everybody gets better. Um, so anyway, for John, the bottom line was, um, no progress until week four. And the reason is that he was undermethylated. And it takes a while for that to be fixed. Rage is complete. And the zinc, again, takes six weeks, really, the zinc and copper. And um, his rages were completely gone after 10 weeks. 
and and that, I think that usually happens in my experience, although not always. And he didn't. The counseling that had helped him was no longer needed at his old loft, and he just seemed to be fine after that. So conduct disorder. These are the kids that are that are tend to be bullies. Or they break things. They when when they have a behavior upset, they might strike out at someone, or break or, or damage property. And uh, most of them have a pyro disorder. Most of the conduct disorder kids, they flunk our blood, our, I'm sorry, our urine pyrrole test. And um, pyrroles are chemicals that are that are uh, created in our in the chemistry in our bone marrow, and and uh, um, they 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 tend to be because of genetics. They tend to be really elevated in some children. And what they do, the pyrroles are just. Uh, they, they leave the body through the through the bloodstream and through the urine. The problem is they have affinity for B6 and they strip zinc out of your bloodstream. And they also strip zinc out of your bloodstream. So it causes a, a, a double deficiency if you have pyrroles. We always rejoice when we find a patient with pyrroles because it is we get the quickest and the most striking improvements with people with py pyrrole disorder. Um, many of them have a copper zinc imbalance uh, that has to be addressed. Some of them have a, elevated toxics. In fact, some children we find the only problem was high high levels of lead or mercury or something like that. But uh, we that's why we have to do the medical process and and do the lab testing and the to identify what is the problem so we'll know exactly what to address. So Brian, I remember him very well because he was a son of uh, friends of mine. Uh, he he was the son of a of a PhD chemist, who was quite brilliant, and his mother was a master of social work who uh, was renowned for really being effective at helping children with behavior disorders. But her own child had a really severe behavior disorder. He was adopted. He was adopted from an Indian tribe, actually. Uh, the, the parents were dedicated. They were capable. But by the time he was 16, he was violent, destructive. He wouldn't go to school. He was truant. He's failing every course. He was taking counseling, not his mother, but someone that she knew was good. And he was taking Prozac because it seemed like that was an issue. But when we tested his chemistry, we were happy to find out that his pyrroles were sky high. Normal is between 8 and 10. He was 82. And again, this was not his parents' fault. It wasn't his fault. He had an inborn, inborn tendency. He had a genetic uh, or possibly epigenetic um, difference in his chemistry that caused him to be like that. So the treatment, of course, zinc and B6, which would help, which would fix the pyrroles, and you know, bring, that would bring his pyrroles down, and that would allow him to have normal B6 levels in his bloodstream. And you need B6 for so many things, and normalize the zinc. We also gave him P5P which is a uh, sometimes a more effective version of B6, biotin, primrose oil, because people with high, um, with high pyrroles, many of them are uh, actually have excessive amounts of omega-3 fats and are low in omega-6. They're the exception to the general rule. And they, these are the ones who do well on primrose oil, which provides them with arachidonic acid and other forms of, of, of uh, of the omega-6 oils and vitamin C and E. As you can see, everything here has to do with individuality, finding out what a person's chemical, biochemical individuality is, and then finding a way to normalize it. So for Brian, uh, he got clearly better after seven days, and that happens with pyro disorder. Uh, sometimes I hear families say that after two or three days, children who were impossible to deal with and were violent and, and uh, really behavior disordered would just suddenly be, you know, be dramatically different after three or four or five days. And that does sometimes happen, although often it takes a month. Um, after two months, he was now calm. He ceased truancy. He started going to school and everybody's surprised he was smart. They, the family said they didn't know that. Became an honor student, even joined the football team. Um, I also found out that with his, since he was so dysfunctional that uh, he, he had very few friends and never had a girlfriend. And the, after, on his follow-up visit, he proudly said that he now had a girlfriend. 
Um, and the bottom line is he became a college student instead of a high school dropout. We wonder how many children in America are like that. Um, my guess is it's probably hundreds of thousands, maybe a million. We've done outcome studies because you need to do research um, when just because you get reports of somebody getting better, that's what science and psychiatry calls an anecdotal case history. And to a scientist uh, and to the field of psychiatry, um, you, you have to discount anecdotal case histories. In other words, you could have a therapy that might have uh, helped 100 people but you still, that's not proof that it works. You need to do careful scientific studies, preferably, preferably double-blind controlled studies. And, and uh, we're engaged in that activity ourselves. And we think that's what's really necessary. I think that psychiatry and science deserves that. So our, our very first one was back in 2004. We, uh, we had a, the Pfeiffer Treatment Center was a clinic that we were operating at that time. And we had a lot of behavior disordered subjects of all ages. We decided to, over a three month period, to, to test all 100% of them. So we, took two, we had 207 behavior disordered patients. We identified their, chemical, their biochemical imbalances and we, get, we pr provided them with a nutrient therapy to correct whatever imbalances we found. And then we measured the frequency of physical assaults, how many times did they physically attack another human being, and property destruction, how many times did they, did they break, you know, destroy property before the treatment and then after. And we published this in a peer-reviewed journal, Physiology and Behavior, uh, 14 years ago, a long time ago. Uh, and this is what we found. These are, this is the, 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 this, the, the data. We found that 91% of the families and their doctors reported improvement. 58% said that, that the, 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 the symptoms, they became symptom free and completely stopped, um, stopped the, the destruction of property and, and stopped their, their, their uh, violent activities. 33% um, said they had a partial improvement and many of those improvements were really pretty good. In fact, wonderful. I remember a family from Connecticut told me that their child had been violent 10 times a day. And, and now it was once a month and life was better for the family, but they were one of our 33% that had partial improvement. And only 9% only failed to improve. Um, that was, this, is, this is the same group for destruction of property. The results were not quite as good. And in this case, 12% uh, of them were still destroying, destroying property, but, that, but the results were, were, were exciting. We presented this uh, at the American Psychiatric Association. I, I, I was asked to report it to the United States Senate and to the Surgeon General's office and, and did those things. And uh, so uh, we continued to do research on this. In, 19, in 2017, I was part of a Australia violence study in this case, it was a collaboration with Griffith University, and uh, our doctor was Dr. Kelly Francis, someone who we had trained for over four or five years, really. And we had 32 violent males, violent in terms of, of physical violence, not verbal violence, ages four to 14. And we used standard evaluation instruments used by psychiatry and by, by learning specialists. Um, the, the tests are called CAS, MOAS, and anyway, these are standard ways of measuring learning capability, attention, et cetera. This was published last year in a um, peer reviewed journal, and it was an open label trial. <coughs> and the results in the Australia study confirmed what we had, what we had found before and what we re were quite confident was happening. Every one of the scales indicated impressive efficacy. Reduced violent behavior, the p-value, the which is the probability that this was just a, a an accident, an accidental fluke, uh, was less than 0 0.001, which means there was less than one chance in a thousand that we didn't really have f efficacy. The side effect profile uh, was very very low. In other words, the treatments, uh, people taking our treatment, uh, there was little or no side effects reported because of our treatment, because we don't 
we, we just normalize biochemistry. We're not giving a, a powerful drug to go in your brain, which can cause side effects. We are just simply attempting to do the best we can to normalize their chemistry. And it, as it, it replicated the earlier study. So overall, what do we recommend? If, uh, if, if a person, if a family finds themselves with a child diagnosed with ADHD, we think you should check out their chemistry. We think you should find out whether this is something that uh, is not related necessarily to their, to, to, to their environment or their life experiences. We think you should check their labs, check their blood and their urine to see if they have chemical imbalances that are part of the problem. So metal metabolism, pyrroles, methylation, toxic metals, and a few other tests. The lab testing that, that we do, we've got a, um, a protocol we use for lab testing, and it tends to cost between three and four hundred dollars to do this testing. And usually you, we have the answer whether or not the, the, the ADHD patient or individual has, the, has this as part of the problem or not. And usually the answer is yes. And then we uh, recommend them, uh, refer them to a, a medical doctor who knows these nutrient therapy protocols to normalize their biochemistry. And we regard drug medication as a last resort. Yes, uh, Ritalin, Adderall, and other amphetamine preparations, they are somewhat effective. And in fact, I think in most cases they are somewhat effective, but we think of it as more of a last resort. And if needed, fine, um, you should use it. But we think the, um, Individualized nutrient therapy is probably a better is definitely a better way to begin. That and counseling, I think, should precede use of drug medications. So uh, I'm going to turn this over to Dana, who is our moderator. Yes. Organizer. So at this time, we're going to begin the question and answer portion of the webinar. So please type your questions in the con into the control panel. And while you're doing that, I'm going to take um, a moment to remind you that the nutrient therapies described by Dr. Walsh during this webinar do require the supervision of a medical physician. Um, you can find a doctor in your area that has um, been, uh, that utilizes Dr. Walsh's protocols by visiting our website, which is Walsh Institute. Dot org to find a doctor in your area. We do recommend that you seek the help of an experienced physician who has attended a Walsh Research Institute Physician Education Workshop because as you've learned today, nutrient overloads and deficiencies have a powerful impact on brain functioning. And uh, one of, I'm seeing here that there are many questions about will the recording and the slides be available? Yes, you will have access to the recording. and I'd be happy to send um, all of you attendees a copy of these slides. So first question is, which SNPs are associated with weakened MT function? Dr. Walsh. Well, there are many. There are many, and it's not just SNPs. SNPs are are um, you might say mutations in in genetically expressed chemicals. See, our DNA uh, does more than just tell determine the color of our eyes and how tall we are and whatever. Uh, we depend on our DNA to to uh, serve us all day, every day, by by they 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 organize and the uh, nutrients that every cell receives, including our brain cells. And um, the problem is that these, these chemicals, these enzymes and these proteins that are genetically expressed, uh, they're usually rather large. They might have as many as 500 or 1,000 amino acids in them. And what, what a SNP is, is one of the amino acids is out of place. For example, the MTHFR gene which is uh, now quite popular and, and is important in methylation. Uh, it has more than 500 um, amino acids. And if you've got, uh, and there are more than 80 SNPs that have been found in that enzyme. However, two of them uh, are especially important. And, and uh, what they do is they weaken the enzyme. 
And so they, they tend to impair and weaken their activity. Now with ADHD, uh, I think the, and, and, and for, for those who have ADHD with a methylation disorder, it's usually SNPs and, and, and MTHFR, although there are others, but usually it's MTHFR, either the 677T or the 1298 SNP. And, but there are others in, in that whole methylation profile. If a person has a copper zinc imbalance, the SNPs almost certainly have to do with genetically expressed metallothionine, which is a which is a, a shorter linear um, uh, um, biochemical that is expressed and has it has the job of regulating the metals, and and so even though it's a smaller enzyme and with fewer SNPs, these SNPs have a greater impact. And they can really uh, impair that, and they can cause the copper zinc imbalance, as we talked about, that affects so many ADHD kids. The pyrrole disorder, we're not, we don't know yet. Science has not yet determined which SNPs are maybe responsible for that. We know it has to do with the uh, biochemistry in your spleen and in your bone marrow, but they've not yet identified what the SNPs are. But eventually, we'll find that too. Okay, so in regards to the elevation of copper, does that only apply to patients with ADHD hyperactive type, or does that apply to inattentive type as well? Uh, we've seen uh, we've seen uh, elevated copper zinc ratios in uh, across the board, really, but it's it's especially high in hyperactivity. Uh, it, it just it's also one of the major causes of depression, especially for females. Uh, the an elevated copper zinc ratio is, is 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 seems to be really important in postpartum depression, and uh, I would say that's about 95 percent. And we have found in treating more than 800 cases of postpartum depression that that we have a, something like a 90 percent of them re, 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 report that that their depression is either better or gone. And, and it has so much to do with an elevation of the norepinephrine and a, and a diminishment of, of um, dopamine. And uh, so it, it, we can find the copper zinc imbalance in, in many different kinds of cases. For example, autism. Uh, about 85 to 90% of children with autism have, uh, have a, um, a copper overload, especially free radical unbound copper. So uh, copper abnormalities, uh, I think we find them throughout all, all types of mental health, even schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. So, and it depends on the individual, which is why one has to carefully uh, look at their blood and urine chemistry and their symptoms and traits in order to diagnose exactly whether or not this is part of the problem. Now, Cindy is asking, how are you testing for pyroles? This is for pyrrole disorder. Well, pyrrole disorder has got some really striking symptoms and traits. Uh, they, they, uh, and, and I've gotten to the point now that I've seen so many of them, I can actually find, I think I can identify people with pyrroles just walking down the street. Um, but the, the key test is a urine test for the concentration of pyrroles. And we know what normal is. And if a person has high pyrroles in their urine, that means that it, I, I think of that like having a, a a hole in the boat. Uh, most of your um, copper and your zinc and even your toxic metals, most of them will leave through this through the stool and not through the urn. Uh, and what happens is that your your zinc is supposed to be regenerated over and over. And what happens if you have pyrrole disorder? You just you're just losing um, lots and lots of your zinc uh, through the urine that you're not supposed to be losing. And zinc is actually the Chem, that's the that's the natural nutrient that causes this metallothionine protein to function, and and it's it, it affects a part of your DNA called a metal regulation element, and so that's the it's an it's it's an epigenetic effect, and um, so that I think the 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 symptoms are so clear with with pyrrole disorder. For example, these are almost always night people. They're not hungry for breakfast. These are the people, They one symptom is they tend to skip breakfast and don't care if they eat uh, in the morning. 
Uh, they, they tend to have pale skin. They're more prone to sunburn than others. They, they, because of the pyral disorder and the severe zinc deficiency, they, their taste is different and they, they tend to love spicy foods. Um, they, they, they're, they're just, just, they also are prone to mood swings that are quite, quite dramatic. And they're usually famous for their, for their temper, regardless of how wonderful they might be and, and when, they're, when they're okay. So, uh, but, but I, I think that's basically a, a urine test. There are only about three or four labs in the world that do that test right. And if you check our website, uh, I think you'll find uh, the, the uh, labs that do that properly. Yes, informating re information regarding laboratory testing and practitioners is available on our website, walshinstitute.org. And it really depends on the practitioner whether they accept insurance or not. It depends on what type of practice, whether it's run independently or they're with a, a larger group organization. I realize that some of you um, have specific questions about other countries, and so for those um, questions, you may send me an email to Dana at walshinstitute.org and we realize that we won't be able to get to all of your questions today, but if we don't get to them, you can email them to me and we'll try to get to them later this week. So the next question from Jody is, hi, my son is 17 years old. He's struggling with OCD. We have tried vitamin B6, tryptophan, 5-HTP, and NAC. What are the other options for this patient or for this young adult who's 17 with OCD? Well, everything you're doing, I think, is uh, a positive. Uh, everything you mentioned is something that would help to some degree. Um, the, 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 one, of the, one, of the, one of the factors you almost always see in, in OCD and OCD tendencies is under methylation. So I think methylation therapy <clears throat> is something that should be uh, should be tried, and you sh I would recommend you find a doctor who knows how to how to help with that. And and the the one thing that has to be emphasized is that even though your 17 year old is almost certainly under methylated, he needs to avoid all forms of folates. And the reason is because we've learned after thousands and thousands of patients that for those who have, have uh, OCD, uh, that even though the folates would improve their methylation, the patient would get worse. And the reason is that folates have an affect gene expression and they affect gene expression of these reuptake proteins. And, and part of the problem with with uh, OCD is almost always low serotonin activity and folates cause your, your serotonin activity to collapse and to drop, even though the methylation gets better. So just want to make sure you're aware of that. Mm -hmm. This person is saying, I'm an undermethylator and I've tried the methionine treatment. It was not effective, why? The methionine and SAMIA treatment for undermethylation is only effective if the if the rest of the cycle is okay. And uh, for example, we would never give methionine or homocysteine or, 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 or SAMI to anyone with elevated homocysteine. And uh, we and the reason really is that when 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 your your methionine converts to SAMI, S adenosyl methionine, which is act you might call it activated methionine. And it's the methyl donor in the body. And if now once uh, once the methyl is, is 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 given up to make a methylation reaction, it the chemical becomes something called SAH, S adenosyl homocysteine. Well, some people who are under methylated have really high levels of SAH, and you must not give those people methionine or SAMI until you first get the homocysteine and the SAH down. And uh, our, our, our doctors that we've trained understand that. And um, it, it is a bad idea just to give uh, methionine or SAMI to an undermethylated person without checking that out first. And there are lab tests that are quite effective at determining that. There's a, um, a doctor's data uh, laboratory has a methylation panel that can, that can Tell you exactly what the what the SAH level is, and and uh, and it can identify blocks uh, in that whole methylation cycle, 
And uh, so the, the, there, there are ways of, of identifying that, and I'll bet you have one of those blocks. Otherwise, you would have improved. The next question is, how do you tell if your child is an over or under methylator? I have had doctors give my daughter supplements that you use for both. All right, and uh, under methylation affects 8% of the U.S. population, and I think it's probably similar around the world. Uh, and 22% of Americans are under methylated. That is, they have below average methylation capability. And the, uh, the treatments for those are, are well established, but they need to be done by, by a doctor who knows what they're doing. And so um, there are growing numbers of doctors that know how to do this. We have doctors who are doing these, these and now I believe in 30 different countries our, our, the book Nutrient Power is now in seven different languages, so this is spreading throughout the world. Um, but you need to have a doctor that knows what they're doing, and uh, if, if, you're, if we're dealing with methylation, you have to be especially careful, because you can do harm if you go in the wrong direction. If you have an undermethylated person and you, and you uh, give them something that, that um, worsens their neurotransmitters, um, uh, you, you, can, you can cause harm. So I think you have to be really careful with methylation therapy. Mm -hmm. I've read that there's controversy on the accuracy of tests for heavy metals like mercury and lead. What have you found to be the best type of testing for heavy metals? Well, the problem with heavy metals is that they don't stay in your bloodstream very long. The, the half-life, for example, if a person accidentally got a shot of mercury, in their diet accidentally, or uh, a thermometer was broken. By the way, we apologize for the noise in the background. Somebody's mowing their lawn. <laughs> um, if, if, uh, if you got a shot of mercury, uh, that would not show up in your bloodstream after f three or four days. And uh, it would show up in, in, in your hair, and it, it would, uh, because some of, some of the toxic would would wind up in your hair, and I, I kind of like to use a hair analysis from a from a, a competent lab, and there are a couple of really good ones, um, and, and and I I know there are good ones both in uh, USA and in Australia and other places, and uh, the uh, EPA has um, published uh, the recommendation that for identifying toxic metals that that hair analysis is better than blood or urine. Although once in a while, the 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 uh, the toxic levels are so high, you can actually see them in blood and urine, even uh, a few days or weeks after the imbalance. The exception is lead. Lead um, in the body, the half life of lead in the body is 22 years, and that's because lead acts as though it's calcium and gets absorbed into your bones. So if a person who has a lot of lead exposure. It's, it's going to be with them to some degree the rest of their lives. But I think uh, hair analysis is a good way. There are challenge tests that, that can do this, but the challenge tests often are not done right because uh, the heavy metals, whether it's mercury, lead, or whatever, 95% uh, of that goes out in the stool. And if, you, and if you do something like a, a challenge with DMSA or DMPS or EDTA, those of you familiar with challenge tests, if you do a 24-hour urine sample before and then do a 24-hour urine sample after doing this chelation, of course the level in the blood is going to be higher because you're sending it out a different door. Instead of only 4 or 5% of the toxics going out in your urine, you're forcing nearly all of it out. So uh, these, the, these challenge tests, uh, urine challenge tests can be done if a per somebody really knows what they're doing. In my experience, uh, more than three-fourths of doctors that do this are not familiar with metal metabolism. And uh, they'll repeatedly do these challenge tests and say, hey, we're getting more mercury out or we're getting more lead out. No, they aren't. What they're doing is they're just causing, um, sending the whatever toxics leave the body uh, out through a different door, all through the urine instead of instead of the stool. So treatments for copper zinc imbalance, right? A lot of kids with these issues have copper zinc imbalance. When they get on a successful treatment program, what does that treatment program entail? Are they on the supplements that correct their biochemistry into adulthood? 
the answer to that is yes and no. Um, if if the anyone has a copper zinc imbalance and it gets corrected with nutrients, which might require for for that imbalance alone maybe two or three or four capsules of of a variety of, of nutrients, um, it it'll come back. And in the case of copper zinc, uh, the imbalance will probably they'll they'll be, they'll feel fine for about a about a month. And then after two or three months, they'll be right back where they were and all the symptoms will be back. The, the, I said yes and no. The reason why some people don't need this is that when you're young, when you're growing, when your cells are rapidly div dividing, every time a cell divides, you use and you lose zinc. So once you stop growing, once, you're, once you stop growing, the zinc deficiency part of that is is just naturally weakened and 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 things tend to get better, and um, the, a number of I, th I think we it's a good idea to retest somebody say at the age of 20 that may have had a copper zinc imbalance before and it may long may no longer be severe and may no longer need to be treated, and a, a lot of children we've seen and a lot of adults we've talked to, with I've talked to a lot of adults with copper zinc imbalances, and many of them were late bloomers. In other words, had a great difficulty in school or had difficulty with behavior. But in their 20s, they changed dramatically and, and became late bloomers. And um, a few of them said they loved to go to high school reunions because nobody could believe how well they turned out. And I think the, the, um, the, the drain on zinc from growth is no longer there. And so it corrects part of the copper zinc imbalance. So that's, I apologize for the long answer, but that uh, usually, if you stop taking the treatment, it will come back. So we can treat this, but we can't cure it. Mm -hmm. Now, in regards to omega-6 and omega-3 levels, do parents need to have their children checked for those levels? Well, for ADHD and behavior, we find that uh, not that, that it's only about, I'd say, between four and eight percent of people really need to have their have have the fatty acid levels tested because what we're looking for are genetic abnormalities um every every patient that we would have and every doctor that would do this right would have a would make sure that the person had a good diet so if you have a proper diet the then the issue is, then the question is do you have a genetic abnormality like the pyrrole severe pyrrole people have the odd situation of having more than enough omega-3 and not enough omega-6, whereas nearly all, I would say 95% of American children probably have too much omega-6 and benefit from omega-3 fatty acids. Um, so we don't usually test fatty acids on our first screen. The reason is about 90% of our patients get better without having to get involved with fatty acids. Um, and also fatty acids are more difficult for a child or even an adult to take. There's a lot more to swallow down. And, uh, and, and so there's a problem with, with compliance. Uh, we try to avoid the fatty acids unless we need them because it tends to knock compliance down greatly, especially for children. Mm -hmm. Next question is, can these imbalances be tested at birth or in parents prior to conception to identify children who are prone to these behavioral disorders so that nutrient therapy can be initiated early? Well, the problem is that the reference levels for blood and urine factors uh, at, at birth are very, very, very different from even when they're two years old or four years old or adults. Um, so we'd rather not do that. I think eventually we'll be able to do that, but uh, you know, you, there are there are extraordinary levels that you can find, but uh, we usually don't recommend pediatric testing. Um, the the uh, we we like to have a patient be at least a year and a half or two years old. We we I've seen more than six thousand children diagnosed with autism, including some very young ones. And we found that uh, unless they were at least 18 months old, that the lab results were not reliable in identifying their chemistry. Every, every tiny child tends to be really low in zinc. And that's normal for many of them because of the rapid growth going on. Another thing I'd like to mention is that testing of, of, of the parents 
it's not a bad idea, especially if somebody, if one of them has a striking imbalance, but a, a, a baby is not, uh, you're not a combination of your mother and father. You're, you really have genetic material from, from uh, many of, of all, all, you know, a combination of your ancestors, and you might be taking after a, uh, an aunt or uncle from three generations back. So it's, it's not a bad idea to try to identify something that might be running in the family. For example, we know that copper zinc imbalances and pyrrole disorder and methylation, all of those tend to run in families. But again, you get exceptions because of the, the, the variety of ancestors that, you, that we all have. Mm-hmm. Just taking a moment to read through some of your questions. We have a few more minutes. You mentioned a slow dosage of zinc introduction. Um, can you describe the importance of that? Yes, if you do not, if you, uh, tr if, if a person has really an excess amount of copper in their body, uh, when we treat it, it leaves it leaves the body through the through the bloodstream, and the the symptoms are generally irritability and anger. That that's the uh, that 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 is the most common symptoms you get. So if you if you do it too quickly, if if you are causing the excess copper to leave too quickly, the blood level of copper will 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 go too high as it's leaving the body. And, and you can get those symptoms. That's, that's typically the issue. For people with postpartum depression, we have to be especially careful because for them, uh, if we don't do this really carefully and gradually, their, their repression could possibly get worse and that could be a lot more serious. Are pregnant women at risk for copper zinc imbalances? Uh, that's really interesting. Uh, a lot of women uh, who developed postpartum depression had no tendency for depression or anxiety at all before they had a child. The reason is that during the nine months of pregnancy, a woman's chemistry, a woman's blood level of, of copper more than doubles. Typically it should be around 80 or 100 micrograms per deciliter and it tends to go over 220. And that's healthy because the baby needs that. The fetus needs that because of the rapid growth. And uh, so what's supposed to happen as soon as, right after delivery, the copper level in a, in, a, in, a, in a mother is supposed to go right back down to normal. But some people don't have that capability. And it's usually metallothionine that I discussed before. If they don't have the, the capability of getting rid of excess copper, which is what metallothionine does, then that, that causes extraordinary anxiety and depression related to norepinephrine and dopamine abnormalities because of that. So yeah, it's caused, there are a lot of people who uh, develop postpartum depression or postpartum psychosis. And it's really because uh, when their copper escalated during the pregnancy, they couldn't bring it back down. Now we know how to bring it back down, but most doctors don't. But if any, anyone with postpartum depression or the history of that should, I think, check out their 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 plasma zinc plasma zinc and serum copper because they might still be having some problems related to it. So if their levels never return to normal and then they got pregnant and they had a child or son or daughter with ADHD, and could that be possible that they I think shared I, their yes, I, biochemical I, balance with their child. I think I think there is a definite connection between uh, postpartum depression of the mother and ADHD and, and the child. So does any of this information that you've shared today, Dr. Walsh, apply to children with autism? We have a son that constantly paces, has low ver verbal ability, and has rages. That's very common, and again, I've seen more than 6,000 cases of autism. In fact, uh, it was our database. We were the ones that, I, that first, back in 1998, we were the ones that first identified and, and discovered that autistics tended to be undermethylated. And at that time, when I reported that to the rest of the world, it seemed like nobody even thought about that as a possibility. But yes, about 95 to 98% of all all persons diagnosed with, with canner autism, with classic autism, not necessarily uh, the, what they call autism spectrum, but with 
they have under-methylation, and that tends to cause ritual behavior and a tendency uh, for, for stimming, but also a tendency for being creatures of habit. Um, yes, I think, I think that, and there, in America, there are hundreds of doctors who are really quite capable of addressing the methylation problem in autism. And I just urge anyone with an autistic child to act immediately because I've learned with uh, the thousands that we've worked with, you can get more progress with a, with a two-year-old in a month than you can in a year with a six-year-old. So early intervention is everything. Autism is treatable, recovery is possible, and I, I think that every child deserves that possibility. And even to, uh, um, adults with autism, advanced nutrient therapies could help with some behavioral issues. That's true, but it's uh, one of my disappointments is that since autism is a developmental disorder, uh, a person who, uh, an adult with autism, if they have, again, classic canner autism, uh, they, their brain isn't the same. And we know in what ways their brain is different. They have different connectivity of different parts of the brain. We know that their their um, their neurons uh, that form these these connections these they're called mini columns uh, in in your cortex of your brain. We know that they're different. So um, once once an autistic um, gets past maybe I would say puberty, uh, it's quite it's more difficult to help them. And yes, you can help them. You can provide them with a better quality of life, especially if they have behavior issues, as many of them do. Very often we can, we can, we can uh, help an autistic adult who might have constant rages and upsets and make their behavior calm. We can help them with a uh, better quality of life, but the possibility of a complete recovery is almost vanishingly small if they truly have autism and they're past the age of 14. Sorry to say that, but that's my experience. And what about borderline personality disorder? We've had a couple questions about that. Borderline personality disorder is an interesting diagnosis. I have a lot of uh, good friends who are psychiatrists. They tell me when a psychiatrist uh, diagnoses borderline personality disorder, that means they don't want to see the patient again. They, they, they'd rather not have that patient, uh, partly because uh, the, the uh, there are no treatments that are reliably can help people with borderline personality disorder. We have, we have tested more than 500 cases of borderline personality disorder. And I think, I think by just normalizing their biochemistry, we've had better success than psychiatric medications for those people. And there's many different types of borderline personality disorder. And uh, the diagnosis itself, um, uh, we, most people that have a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder will come in with completely different diagnoses. So the diagnosis itself, uh, I wouldn't take it as an established fact if you have someone in your family with that diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Do you have any experience with Tourette's syndrome together with Asperger's syndrome with your Walsh protocol? Yes, we've had a number of cases of patients uh, with Tourette's syndrome. Um, and we know a lot about that. We, the, the problem is that Tourette is what's known as an epigenetic disorder. That means that, that the, the, this, this person's DNA is permanently changed by, by envir some environmental insults, some in, one or more environmental insults. And so the Tourette is not likely to go away ever. They're gonna have to face that the rest of their lives because their gene expression has been changed. It's almost always related to under-methylation. So methylation therapies can certainly help. Um, the, the, um, the, there are therapies that uh, about, are about 15 to 20% successful in almost eliminating Tourette's. Uh, we know that cesium chloride, for example, can be really helpful. And free-form amino acids, that is the, the um, the, the amino acids that are not in proteins, but, but have been separated into the individual amino acids, that, that, that cesium chloride and free form amino acids are helpful along with uh, trying to normalize methylation as best as possible. That, that, 
that's the approach we've taken. Um, we, we get a really nice response with only about 15 or 20%. We get, I think about 80% say there's some marginal improvement, but Tourette is difficult. I think mainly because it's a, it, it is chain, it involves a permanent change or at least a semi-permanent change in probably 50 or 60 genes. Mm -hmm. We only have time for a few more questions. Um, the next one is, do these ADHD and behavior disorder nutrient therapy treatments also help adults as much as they help children? Uh, we've had thousands and thousands of adults with ADHD. Uh, and the interesting thing for me is that the chemistry is the same. The chemical abnormalities and balances are the same, but it takes longer for, for an adult to recover or to respond. Um, what would normally take uh, six or eight or 10 weeks for a, a say a, a 10 year old or a 12 year old, it might take as long as four or five or six months for the adult to get the benefit of the treatment. Chemistry is the same, we can, we can normalize the chemistry, but the, uh, they have to be more patient and they have to hang in there for a longer time with the treatment. But um, my experience is if, they, if they're able to do that, they can get they can get really the, the same results. Mm -hmm. Okay, our last question for today: um, If getting our child tested and evaluated by one of your Walsh physicians is not financially feasible, would it be okay to try and give a child or my teen any of these supplements that you spoke about to see if it would make a difference? Well, um, I, I don't recommend it. However, uh, we have a lot of people contacting us from from Africa and from third world nations where they don't have the ability to do testing, much less the, um, much less the money to do the testing. Um, I, I was, if, if, if that was somebody in my family uh, and I was in that situation, I would study this as much as I can because you can do a pretty good job of identifying chemical imbalances with symptoms and traits. And I would, I would do the best I could but really, if you can afford to have um, a, a knowledgeable doctor, that is absolutely the best way. And there's only only if a person is living in uh, outer Mongolia or something where where that's not possible, you still would have, I think you should still do the best you can, but you really need to do the lab testing. Well, and the takeaway is that what you've learned today is that all children are biochemically unique. So what one child may need is very different from the other. So to walk into a store and to try supplements randomly here and there would be, um, would do a disservice to your child and improper treatment affects brain neurotransmitters. So we do not want to cause harm. I'd like to mention that the, when I first started doing clinical work, the greatest surprise I had was, and it was a big surprise, <coughs> was that uh, yes, a, a lot of people have, because of genetics or diet, are deficient in nutrients. But what I learned, to my surprise, was that the greatest mischief is caused by nutrients that are in overload. And that's why multiple vitamins usually don't work. You're usually making matters worse with those nutrients that, because of genetics, you're overloaded in. So really, you cannot help a person by just stuffing them full of amino acids, vitamins, and minerals the odds are they'll be somewhat worse. Okay, thank you all so much for joining us. I'm sorry that we didn't have time to take all of your questions, but again, please feel free to email me at Dana at walshinstitute.org. Visit our website, walshinstitute.org for more information. And also please remember to visit our friends at NHRI, Natural Health Research Institute. Their website is Natural Health research.org to sign up for their latest health research articles and their monthly newsletter. Thank you.